everybody. Uh, thank you guys for logging in today. Um, we'll get started here in just a minute. Um, oh, I do want to thank everybody, uh, or at least a few people for helping out with this. Um, the Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board, um, Dr. Redden, who's our uh, oh, director now of the center. And then um, oh, also uh, Robert Pritz for helping us um, get this thing all set up here today. So uh, also uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you guys have any questions, um, I'll feel free to post those into the uh, chat room and we'll answer those at the very end. Um, I do want to thank our sponsor for today, uh, Lone Star Tracking. If you guys are looking for any type of GPS trackers or anything like that, um, go ahead and give Thomas a call over at Lone Star Tracking and he'll get you set up with the GPS trackers that we use. So Dr. Deb Zorn is our presenter today. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Veterinary Small Animal Clinical Sciences at Texas A&M University. Uh, she's a founding member of the Texas A&M Veterinary Emergency Team, and she's been on over 20 deployments to multiple disasters in Texas and beyond. Uh, she's a 1984 graduate of Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, following graduation, she entered private clinical practice in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, she returned in 1987 to Iowa State University for her small animal internal medicine re residency. Um, in, she moved to Texas in 1990, and she completed her PhD in nutrition at Texas A&M University. And since 1996, she's been a member of the faculty at Texas A&M University, where she's actively involved in clinical teaching and research activities in small animal, small animal nutrition disaster preparedness, and gastroenterology and feline medicine. So thank you very much for uh, presenting for us today, doctor. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Very good, Bill. Thank you so much. Uh, that, that was a, a great introduction and, and a long introduction of my career as a uh, I like to say my, that I'm a utility fielder. I can, I can t cover a lot of bases. Um, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. I've been involved with uh, nutrition basically since I got my PhD at Texas A&M in, in 97. It's, uh, it's an incredibly important thing that we do, whether you're trying to deal with the health of an animal that's, that's ill or has got an injury or needs a recovery, or whether you're just trying to keep animals um, healthy and working. Um, just to add a little bit more detail to my background before we kind of dive into this and, and I tell you what we're going to try to cover today. Uh, the picture on the cover here is um, one of the working dogs that I, um, it, uh, that I work with on, um, practically on a daily basis now these days. Um, <clears throat> for the past about seven, eight years, I've been a member of Texas Task Force One and their primary veterinary support for their working canines. And um, and so I have been working a lot uh, with uh, not only their nutritional needs, but um, at the federal levels with trying to, to work at uh, w what is the right way to feed these animals uh, to maximize their work and minimize their injuries and so on. And so while it's a little bit different than, than your type of dogs, your herding dogs and your, and your working dogs at work in the field, um, there are lots of similarities. Uh, they don't have to climb over rubble like this gal does, but um, there's, there's a lot of need for the endurance, the agility, and proper nutrition to make it all work. Um, so um, this is always a hard topic uh, to, to work with when you're not completely certain about what everyone's background is going to be in your audience. And so over the years, I have taken the tact that I'm, I'm going to start super easy and basic and then we'll get into details that are a lot more down in the weeds and very specifically for what you should, what type of foods that you should be feeding for a dog with a certain type of work. Um, one of the questions I get most commonly asked is what should I feed my dog? And that comes from not only clients, it comes from working dog handlers and it comes from just people I meet. And, and I think um, before I just make you all angry and say, I'm not going to answer that directly. Uh, let me explain why. Um, I think you would understand immediately if I asked you to imagine in your own family how, and, and I mean your broad family, your broad human family, 
uh, how you have a lot of different people who have a lot of different, not only nutritional needs from the perspective of their bodies just handle things differently, but also they have unique needs based on what they do uh, for a living, whether they're exercisers or active versus more sedentary, on and on and on and on. And I start this talk with that very big reminder because what I'm going to really try to get you guys to think about, and I know that many of you may have herds of these dogs. You may have six to 10 or more of these dogs. And, and your goal is to simplify that. And I understand that because I work with, I've worked with military working dogs and I've worked with people who house groups of dogs and trying to, to manage them in a more straightforward way. But I will tell you, um, and I will remind you repeatedly that nutrition is about the most individual thing that you're ever going to deal with. And so if you try to deal with this in a one size fit all, fits all, it'll be challenging for you. Um, we're going to talk about food dosage. In other words, how much you feed. Um, and, and, and I know all of your dogs are working dogs, but there's different types and layers and intensities of working dogs. And so we need to focus on that a little bit. We will talk about food selection, um, commercial versus whole. I don't know if you guys uh, primarily feed commercial versus some of you feed raw or whole food. Um, we can go into a lot of that at the end of this. That's hard to, to detail very specifically with um, going through this talk, but I do want to talk about that because there are some important things to understand about that. And, and all of my working dog handlers, there's a lot of them that do feed some raw in their diet. Uh, we'll talk about nutrient ratios. We'll talk about grain-free and some of the dangers there. Um, and then we'll talk about um, specific needs. So there a lot of things. So the first thing that you have to understand about what you've got going on in front of you is what is your goal? Is, you is your goal growth, reproduction? Do you have all adult animals that you're trying to avoid risk and you're trying to increase athletic performance? Are you trying to just keep them around for a long, healthy life. What is your goal? And maybe there's different parts of those goals throughout life of your animal. That's typical. And especially in animals that are handler, you know, persons like yourself that are either breeders or handlers or have um, working animals or you need that athletic performance, but that athletic performance comes and goes in waves. Um, so we're going to try to fit all of that together in this. Now, the first thing I want to talk about as we go into this is the importance of this. And I'm, this is going to sound very simplistic. It's going to sound very basic. And it's going to sound like, okay, I don't, I don't need to know this. I'm going to tell you that one of the things that will affect your dog's athletic performance faster than anything is to not have a balanced diet. And, and you can take a dog that is on a commercially available athletic performance food, whatever you, whichever one you want to name, whether it's, you know, some Merrick brand or some, some special brand for your, for your type of dog. It doesn't matter if it's balanced, it's balanced. The minute we start adding supplements to it, the minute we start adding outside things to it, the minute we start adding either protein or fat or anything else from the outside. Now we create imbalance and that's when we can actually start to see problems and you're not going to see them immediately. One of the most important things to take away from this is nutritional deficiencies and excesses are rarely seen in times of days or weeks. They are typically seen over months or longer even into years, depending on which deficiency or excess that it is. And so what I'm saying is this is something that you will not see coming. It is a slow moving thing that will come over time. And so it's really important to recognize that this is an important foundational goal for a diet. And the next thing I wanna talk about is, is it's a touchy subject for many people. Um, I love the subject because I work with dogs and cats. I work with all species that are companion animals. I don't do skunks and all the other things that you see on the page here. But we know that dogs come from order carnivora, and that's important to know. But the question that I'm going to ask you, and I want you to understand, and I want you to be careful to understand, is that, in fact, there are different kinds of carnivores. 
in order carnivora. There are carnivores that are absolute obligate true carnivores, meaning in the absence of animal tissue in their diet, they will die. A cat cannot be a vegan ever. A cat cannot eat plant oils. Can't, you can't top dress corn oil on a cat diet and expect those fats from that fat source to provide what they need. They cannot do it. They have to have animal fat and animal flesh. That's a true carnivore. Um, true carnivores exist um, in, in actually very small numbers. The next layer of carnivores that we have are what we call the facultative carnivores. They're carnivores. They like to eat meat. They like to have that as a major percentage of their diet, but they're actually adapted both metabolically and physiologically and anatomically in all of the parts to have and consume plants in their diet and plant materials, you know, berries and a variety of other things, but plants in their diet that they can take those plant materials, metabolize them and create amino acids and fatty acids that aren't from an animal tissue. That makes them facultative, okay? That is very different than being an omnivore or being a true carnivore, okay? So I'm gonna say it again. Dogs and dogs versus wolves. Wolves in some of the some of the still more um, primordial carnivores are true or obligate carnivores. Cats are absolutely in that category. Dogs, companion dogs specifically, are facultative carnivores. And what that means to you and why you should care about it is, if you feed an exceedingly high protein diet, and and in doing so take away uh, a lot of the plant material that's present in typical canine diets. Eating the ingesta of the inside of the animal they killed is partly that omnivore, omnivore facultative carn carnivore action. You actually now are forcing that body that has changed over time to metabolize protein in a way it's not ready to do anymore. And we see this, I see this in the clinics in people that are feeding companion dogs or non dogs that aren't high level working dogs. And I'll, and I'll explain this more in detail in a second. Levels of protein that match what cats get. So 40, 50, 60% of their diet as protein. And they come in to me with liver problems. They come in with proteinuria. In other words, their kid, that protein is spilling over into their kidneys and urine. This causes kidney damage, which will cause kidney failure over time. It is not something to be played around with. High protein that can be used for energy in an actively working dog is important. Too much protein in a dog is dangerous. And so we want to find where that that balance is, and I want to make sure everybody understands that. Dogs are not true carnivores. They're facultative carnivores. They have adapted to having plants in their diet. So what does that mean? So that means, yes, they have to have amino acids and protein in their diet at certain levels. The levels go up when they are working. Nope, let me go back. The levels go up when they are working. They need greater muscle function and activity, and I'll explain that more in a minute. But dogs do use more protein for energy than carbohydrates when they are in lengthy work cycles. For example, one of your herding dogs that is herding over, herding in a set of animals actively over hours will have a higher requirement for protein in their diet than a dog that mostly is herding, is out there amongst the herd and mostly at rest with short bursts of activity, okay? Same for fat. You have a very high active working dog, you're gonna add more fat because it's protein and fat is what keeps muscle function at its peak in long lasting activity. In short term activity, it's the car carbohydrate energy sources the short-term energy sources that they need, okay? And that's been shown in research across years and years and years and years of looking at this. And so I'm gonna to try to bring that to you so you have a, a good understanding of that. So, so 
you can't one size fits all. All dogs get high carbs when they're working. No, actually, when they're hard working, they need a certain level of protein and fat. And when they're more short term working, more bursts of working energy, like a sprinter, they sprint and then they rest, they sprint and then they rest. That's a that need, that's a more of a carbohydrate need. All right. And so we'll, we'll continue down that process. Another little bit of information just to give you a, a better understanding how we know all of these things to be true. Um, over years, um, we've tried to better understand the differences between facultative and true carnivores and, and the dog and the cat are good examples to compare. But if you take a similar sized dog to a similar sized cat, their GI tract in the dog is much longer than that of a same sized cat. And the reason for that is they have over time genetically adapted to being able to handle a diet that has plants in it. Plants require a GI tract that is longer, that has different capabilities than an animal that only eats animal tissue. Animal tissues, protein, and fat that come off of the carcass of an animal don't need a lot of time in the GI tract. The enzymes break them down and they get absorbed and off to the races we go. The same is true for the colon of the cat. There's not a lot of plant material left over for that to sit there a long time. In the dog, it's very, very different. They have a longer GI tract because they have adapted over time to the need to have this and the, and the desire to have this in their body. And to be able to use those things, their bodies adapted accordingly. Another thing I want to point out before we really get into talking about diets and picking them and how we look at nutrients, these, these graphs are up here to remind you that diet isn't just the amount of protein or the amount of fat or the amount of starch that's present in it. We're going to point, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about certain amounts of each of those. Okay. I'm going to talk to you about, you know, you should have this much protein if they work this hard and so on and so on. But when you look on a label and particularly in a dry food, which I presume that the vast majority of you who are feeding commercial foods feed primarily um, dry food because that is easier to store, it's energy dense, and so on and so on. The thing that you have to remember that is in the processing of dry food, in the processing of dry food, you change its digestibility. That's just the nature of the beast. Okay, that's the nature of the beast. You cannot feed dry food or any commercially prepared food that is cooked or processed or extruded. You cannot feed any commercially prepared food without affecting the digestibility of the nutrients. Okay. And so pet food companies that are reputable and of high quality and put out high quality foods know this, and they will do what is called po post-processing evaluation or quality control. And so that they now know that once they've processed that food and cooked whatever they've cooked out of it, that the ingredients still meet nutritional needs. That is not a universal requirement, nor is it a universal thing across companies. So if you are using a company that you are unsure of whether they do post-processing QC, you should ask. The next thing to understand is that nutrients because of this processing and because of this impact on their bioavailability, that takes that number that you are looking at on the bag and changes it. So just for example, let's say that you're feeding a dog food that says on the bag it's 20% protein, okay? It's 20% protein. That's the amount of protein that is in the food in the bag. If that food is an average dog food, it's going to be 85% digestible. That's it, guys. There is nothing on the market that is processed the food that is above 90% protein digestibility. It's not attainable. Protein, when it's cooked, um, denatures, and so you lose it. And so 85% is a good number. That's the average of the good companies out there you could be feeding a food that's much lower than that. That's something you cannot know. It's proprietary knowledge. 
Okay. And so I, what I tell folks about food is you, you expect your food to be 85%. That means that if you're feeding 20% out of the bag, you're not really feeding 20%. If it's, if it's 80%, you're really feeding 16. Okay. You're really feeding 16. The other thing to know about that is the greater the leftovers, in other words, the indigestible food sources in there, the more you are going to have ingest a leftover in the GI tract, which leads to two things. Ingest a leftover in the GI tract can lead to more issues with uh, stool quality, stool character, uh, more problems with uh, bacterial, diarrheal, GI upset problems because that leftover food source is available to the intestinal mic microflora to be digested and acted upon, okay? So an animal with a, a diet that is less digestible is going to have the potential for more intestinal problems. The second thing that you will see is those animals will have a larger stool volume. Now, you can't go just on digestibility, protein, fat, and starch. You also have to look at the fiber in there because fiber is going to change that too. But if you have a dog or a group of dogs that are making massive, massive fecal volumes, you are feeding a dog that a, a, a food that is, is not agreeing with their digestive tract and is probably not as highly digestible as you need it to be, especially for an athlete. Athletes don't need to be carrying a lot of poop volume and athletes need to have their food be highly digested. That's going to force the issue on the type of food you go after in terms of cost. The good or bad news, it depends on how you look at it, is fat and and, and starch, which means carbohydrates, are generally always more digestible in dry foods because they're easier to get to be digestible. And so you don't have to worry about so much, um, am I losing my fat and my starch in a food from, from its cooking? It's the protein where you lose it. The protein is where you have your problems, okay? So just remember, average foods are only gonna be about 85% digestible, less than average foods, are going to be as low as 75 or 70 percent digestible and that's going to leave you basically you think you're feeding a 20 percent protein diet and you're really not you're feeding 15 or less that that's critical especially if you're having a dog that's having trouble keeping on muscle mass all right so this is this is a slide that i'm going to slide past pretty quickly but i put it here just to remind you where in the scheme of life dogs fit relative to protein need relative to carnivores Dogs do not need more than 12 to 15% of metabolizable energy. That's what ME stands for on average for basal protein intake. Okay. So that's a, that's a dog at rest, a dog that's a house pet, a dog that has a regular diet, a regular day's life. I go for walks. I run around the backyard. I do the things that is, more protein than that is absolutely inessential and may be detrimental if you start getting up too high without adjusting some other things. Okay, so that's the reason that this is here. Now, so now let's look at it from a perspective of what, what should you typically feed if you have a dog that is primarily a sprinter, does short-term activity, or is primarily um, a companion to your family and does some herding, okay? Okay that animal should be fed something like this, a typical pet dog diet. And there's quite a variety, somewhere between 12 and 18% protein, somewhere between 10 and 14% fat. And carbohydrates are going to vary widely depending on how much fiber you put in there and how much and what type of food you're trying to feed, whether you're trying to feed. And, and we'll get into the to the grain business here in a second, but the bottom line is you 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 don't want to go grain free. You may want to go corn free. You may want to go wheat free. You may want to go certain grains decreased. I'm okay with that. Grain free means you take away all grains. That means you take away the rices. That means you take away the barley's. That means you take away a variety of carbohydrates. That quite frankly, if you take them out of the canine diet you're gonna make it really, 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 really hard to balance their diet. And it's the reason for the cardiomyopathies that we have been seeing in dogs that go completely grain-free. 
<clears throat> I am, I am, I have seen many, 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 many dogs that have corn and wheat intolerances. That's real. I understand it. I don't need my dogs to eat co corn and wheat if they have an intolerance to it. But all carbohydrates being gone from their diet is actually um, quite dangerous unless you've got someone very, very carefully replacing the missing amino acids and fatty acids that come from those ingredients. All right. Now that's typical. Now let's say that you have a dog or a group of dogs that are really quite high level working, meaning they're not just sprinting occasionally, mostly resting, having short term sprints like an agility dog or short term sprints like I'm moving the sheep around this afternoon for a half an hour and then we're done. That is a sprinting animal, okay? Sprinting animals do not need more protein than what's down there on there. Everything else is the same. They do not need more protein than that. Any higher protein than that, you're not only putting a higher need on um, their protein degradation machinery and their kidneys, but you're also just adding calories, which means that if they're not working, if they're not an active working dog, you're going to put pounds on it. All right. We don't want any extra pounds. Um, all of these dogs should be lean. Um, we want that. They can't work at efficiency if they're not. Now, if you have a dog that's in that intermediate category, um, my search and rescue canines, we talk about being intermediate duration athletes when they're deployed and, we t and, when, they're, and when they're working or exercising or training, but they are actually more like sprinting or um, high level companions when they're not deployed. And so we literally, my, my handlers are literally adjusting their diets up and down throughout the year because if, if I leave them at intermediate duration athlete level during non-deployment times or non-high training times, they, they gain weight. If I, if I don't leave, put them at that higher amount when they're working, they lose muscle mass, okay? So, so you're going to also find, and this is what also makes all my veterinarians crazy and my clients crazy, is like, I want it to just be easy. And I'm like, I'm sorry. Um, nutrition is one of those things that can't just be the same every day. Um, endurance and, and endurance dogs that, that really aren't going to be any endurance dogs in any of your dogs. Um, we are literally talking about sled dogs and only hunting dogs that go on these hunting um, in northern climes where it's super cold, where they're doing this for days on end in um, situations where they have to work for days and days and days and days in very, very difficult um, environmental situations. So so the, the amounts of food that are in fed, fed to endurance dogs, to sled dogs, is just out of this world. It's very interesting. It's nothing that any of our dogs can handle. All right, so just a quick summary of what we've been talking about so far. And Bill, I, I have no time clock in front of me, so you'll have to help me because I'm famous for talking and talking and talking, and then when time comes to stop, you know, don't. Um, <laughs> but here we are. Um, so in summary, just, just remember that domestic dogs are not obligate carnivores. Okay. Feeding purely meat without carbohydrates is not a, is not a good idea. Um, they really do best if we've got the mixture. Yes, they absolutely need that protein. We want it to be high quality protein. We want it to be in a higher than a normal, regular sedentary dog protein but we don't want it up in the 40, 50% range. That is, that is unhealthy and dangerous. We also want to remember that while they are not obligate carnivores, if they are working and working daily or working many hours in a day over days and days and days and days, they will begin immediately to use their muscle mass for that protein need they have. And that is going to actually cut into and decrease their not only athletic capability, but it is also going to increase their risk of injury. Okay, so there is a fine line here between what's too much and what's not enough. All right, so we're going to jump into some of that. 
All right, so a quick slide on all the different things about dogs, and we know they're not the same and they can't eat the same. Very good. One size does not fit all. Um, one of the most important reasons why I put this slide up here before, before we move on is, and I know you guys, um, if you're like all of my hunting dog partners and certainly my search and rescue um, partners, um, your preference is for your dogs um, to be lean, to maybe show ribs, um, to for sure be able to see flanks. Um, and, and I 100% support that. Um, dogs that are carrying any excess condition in the sense of fat are not athletes. They cannot be athletes. They cannot sustain work. They are more prone to heat intolerance. They are more prone to injury. They are not going to have the same length of lifespan as a lean dog. So I'm 100% with the lean from the perspective of fat. However, at the same time, all of my working dogs, hunting dogs and search dogs, which are the ones I have the most, in, most connections with, have to have good muscle mass, have to have good physical fitness. And that means it's not just about what you eat. You know, and I know, that you can eat the best diet on the planet, and that will not keep you thin, and that will not keep your muscles in good condition. There has to be the fitness that goes along with the right nutrition. And that's the point of this picture. Right, wrong nutrition, um, bad things happen. All right, very good. Now, I'm, I don't, I don't want to stop and ask a question, but I just want to point this out very quickly because I know that generally in most uh, situation with handlers and certainly on my side of the fence, um, we, are, we are food restricting um, dogs. We are feeding at certain times, we are feeding very little amounts of food before they work. Um, there, there's a lot of things that I suspect probably is true in your field as well. But I also know a lot of um, folks that are in kennels that have a lot of animals. Um, I work with the prison, for example. And a lot of their tracking trailing dogs, sometimes they will, instead of um, doing food restricted or specific amounts of food for an individual animal, because that's a lot of work when you have a large number of dogs, um, they will time restrict uh, to limit intake, um, particularly in animals they know that are, that, that need to, um, you know, be careful about how much they eat, the easy keepers, the females that tend to want to put on weight and so on. Um, I, I absolutely caution you about using that time restricted. Um, first and foremost, um, again, if, if you're not careful and you don't understand how much they've eaten, um, that, that creates a problem over time. Um, but it, it can also lead to food, uh, aggression. And, and there's some data out there, of course, in your dogs, which are generally smaller, um, GDV is not a huge problem with a lot of your herding breeds. Uh, I'm, I'm still going to tell you, um, it, it is not an ideal way to feed these dogs, um, unless you just don't have other options. Um, knowing what they're eating, feeding a specific amount of food is, is going to be better. I want to briefly just go into energy requirements on these guys. Most of you probably have a pretty good idea how much to feed um, based on this, but I do want to put some numbers out in front of you just so that you have them. I will be honest with you. Um, I will start with numbers in, in a new dog, but then after that, it's totally focused on their body, their body condition. Are they the condition that I want them? Take some food away, add some food. Um, it is not based on a calculation. So while I'm going to give you these numbers, um, because if you get a new dog, you have to have a starting point. You have to have a fo focus or a target. And if you have a dog that you're feeding a, what you think is a lot to, um, you can then maybe do some calculations and say, well, how far off target are they really? Okay, so, so that's the point of this. Um, so first of all, it's like we talked about lean condition. That means you should be able to see ribs. You should be able to see a very nice waist tuck. There should be no fat over any of their top line or over the top of their head. In other words, you touch on the top of their head, you should be able to feel that bone very easily. Ideal, lean. 
Um, it's what makes them be able to do crazy things. Um, all right, so resting energy. Resting energy requirement is that very bottom line energy requirement for what they need for basal metabolism and function. Your dogs are not gonna live on resting unless they are kenneled, injured, off work, um, or are getting to the point in their life where they're no longer doing high active herding days, and then they will get down close to RER. So this is a reasonable thing to kind of tuck away somewhere. It's body weight in kilograms times 30, and then add 70 to that. That is RER. Um, and so it is, it is not useful for the day-to-day -day working dog unless they are injured. And, so, and when they are injured or they have to be cage rested or kennel rested or any of those, then you are going to have to decrease intake to keep them from turning into a balloon. All right. So <clears throat> daily um, energy requirement or maintenance energy requirement, it's, it's called both different things. That's why I put both of those up there is resting energy requirement, that previous equation I gave you times a factor, all right? So, you know, fat dogs, you're going to go RER or less. Dogs that are semi-active, normal, up and about, do some things, are going to go one to one and a half times RER. That's it. Regular standard companion dogs can't eat much more than RER when they're spayed or neutered. And I'm going to circle back around that in a minute because... I, am, I, I would suspect that some of your animals are intact and some are not. So we'll talk about that. Here are the differences in adding some multiplication factors for RER. So for example, a growing puppy needs two or three times RER. And a, a bitch in gestation or lactation is gonna need quite a bit more than RER. But it varies depending on how big she is, how many puppies she has and so on and so on. These are ranges because you have to adjust. You can't just pick a number and go, here it is. Working dogs. I have some working dogs that if I go greater than three times RER on them, they get fat. And they are active, but they're easy keepers. And I have some Labrador, crazy town working dogs that when they're in on a deployment and we're in tough working conditions, um, that, that might be hill climbing or that might be working in mud or whatever it is that we've had to go as high as eight to 10 times RER just to keep them from losing muscle. So, so the point that I'm making is you start with that basal RER and then you target a number and you may have to up or down that number depending on how active their work is, whether they're resting, it's winter and they're not doing much or it's summer and they're super active. Um, and move that number up or down based on what their body condition looks like. Um, so this is a, a quick thing. I'm going to go by this pretty quickly. Most of everybody knows how to do this. Estimate their RER, determine their DER, figure out your food. I want to get to that. And, and that's, this, is, this is sort of an interesting thing in the pet food industry. So let me put some things up here. Um, if you're a purist, you're going to calculate it. I don't know how many of you are purists, but I have working dog handlers that go into that sort of detail. Um, I don't recommend it. It's a lot of time consumption. You can, buy, um, you can buy programs on the computer to help you with all of that. I don't recommend it I, because the bottom line is it's a number and you're going to have to adjust it based on what your dog does. Now, here's the problem with labels. Labels and websites. There is no legal requirement or federal requirement or label requirement for them to put on the calories, which makes me absolutely unbelievably crazy because the, the amount that they put on the label is based on an average of an average sized dog. And so for a whole bunch of dogs, it's way too much food. So if, it, if that label says feed two cups to your dog, it may or may not be the right amount. My preference is, is that you figure out, find out, get them to tell you, or hopefully they have it on the label and you use that calorie count to see where you are relative to RER or MER or what you think your target ought to be. 
So this is just a, a slide that does this. And I, actually, Bill, I was going to tell you this. I don't mind um, uh, making a PDF and sending it to you so that you can um, share some of the slides like this that have some information on them that might be nice to have. Um, the picture slides aren't so helpful, but sometimes these slides are helpful. It, it's just going through the process of calculating uh, how much feed and how much difference a very high energy, energy density diet versus a very low energy density diet. 295K cows a cup is a low energy density diet. It is going to be an inappropriate food for most really active dogs. You're probably going to need to be in the four, 400K cow per cup range. But if you're at that range and your dog suddenly now gets hurt or your dog suddenly gets not working, now you're going to have to cut it down because it's going to be too much. This picture is, is here just to kind of illustrate what I've been talking about all along, which is you're going to make a calculation that's based on averages. That's what these numbers are based on. Your dog may be the one that's over here on this side of the range, and if you don't feed him two or three or four times what is recommended, he doesn't keep weight on because he's high drive or he's high use or he's still intact or all of the things. On the other hand, you may have a dog that sets over here. It's a little bit common for the females, particularly the spayed females. They are going to have a much lower energy need. Their, their metabolism is going to be decreased by being spayed. You're going to have to be more focused on how much energy you give that dog. At the same time, you're going to have to be focused on making sure she maintains muscle mass, which means you may be balancing I'm feeding a lower fat diet, but a higher protein diet, and so on. Again, optimal ranges um, for what they're doing. All right, keeping going, because I know we're, we're, we're times pushing along. This is a really important slide, folks. Um, there is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely an obesity epidemic in our world, and, and that may not be true in your working dogs, but it can happen really quickly if they stop working. And that's because foods are so energy dense. And because if you're used to feeding a certain amount, it's really easy to keep feeding that certain amount. It's also important to remember that, let's say you keep your males intact until they're two or three, which I 100% strive for people to do because it allows their uh, bones and joints to completely develop um, past 18 months to two years. That's really important for any dogs that are Labrador size or bigger. The smaller um, working dog breeds, maybe not so much, but there is clear evidence that if we spay or neuter dogs um, that are of medium to larger breeds, that does impact their skeletal development, their joint development, and puts them in a greater risk of osteo osteoarthritis later in life. So I'm a big proponent of keeping them intact as long as possible, allow that joint development and that, and that bone development. That being said, it is super, super, super hard in some situations where you have multiple males and females around that you are not going to mate to keep them around and keep them working. And so a lot of folks will spay their females and leave their males a little bit longer. No matter when you decide to neuter them, if you neuter them or, or what, you are going to have an obesity problem with the neutered males or females if you don't cut their energy down after the fact by 30%, 3-0. Now, when I say energy, I'm talking about fat and plus or minus carbohydrate. And so, in other words, if you're still working this dog, they need those proteins for their muscle. But if you leave the fat level up at that 18, 20, 22% range, which is a typical working dog diet, you are not going to be able to keep them lean. You can't feed them a small enough amount of food. And that's a, it's a huge problem. And as you all know, there's only so much exercise that you can do to keep weight off. It's also about what you eat. Um, I'm going to briefly, look, let's put this slide up here, but I want to get um, down to some specifics for your, your guys in terms of protein amounts. So the, the biggest thing is just remember, if you're, if you're raising pups, they are going to need specific foods, large breed puppy if they're larger breeds, 
Um, do not free choice feed them, multiple small meal feed them and, and look at how they're gaining in terms of how you're feeding. Okay, and that we could spend a whole hour talking about just feeding babies. All right, so again, um, the energy needs for the types of work they do. Sprinters rarely need more than one and a half times resting, sometimes two. Rarely. That means police dogs. That means agility dogs. That means a lot of the short-term work dogs rarely need more than that. Be very careful with how much energy you feed them. Okay. So the dogs in the middle, and I'm presuming that a lot of your herding dogs fit here when they're working hard, there's a range. Okay. So let's go now into some of the things that we need. So energy density increase when they're at deep, when they're at high levels of work. For the intermediate level of dogs, so the dogs that you guys are working with, protein in the 22 to 28% range. Most of the working dog food, so Purina Pro Plan Sport, for example, is 30-20. That's, that's, that's the high-end protein at 30, and it's a high-end fat at 20, but high-end for working at this range, which is a good starting place. They also have a 25-18. There are other companies that do the same thing. Look for that. And then adjust your protein based on, is the, are they maintaining their muscle mass? and adjust their fat based on, are we keeping them lean? Fat is strictly energy. Protein is what's helping us preserve our muscle. If you have a dog that is not, that is, is having trouble, you've taken away the fat and is still having trouble keeping weight where it needs to be, lower the protein. Because remember, if you're not burning protein, fat, or carbs, they're stored as fat. All of them, all of them. So it's too much of something. So you take away the fat first. If that's still caught, if you're still having problems keeping them where you want them, take the protein down. If you have a dog that's nice and lean, you don't want any more energy on board, but he won't keep his muscle on him, add protein. Fat will not make muscle stay on. Protein makes muscle stay on. Okay. All of them should have some omega-3s in their diet. That's anti-inflammatory. All of them should have some soluble carbohydrate, what we call prebiotics and or probiotics in their diet. We'll get to that at the end. Um, and then the rest um, is just try to get the highest quality, highest digestibility of the diet as you can get your hands on. All right, oops, that went too fast. All right, sprinting dogs, again, be careful with protein, be careful with fat because their needs are short-term. These guys are the ones that if you make them grain free, you, you might not only even have a problem just in the missing amino acids and the missing fatty acids that can create the cardiomyopathy that comes along with it. You are also missing storing muscle glycogen. Muscle glycogen is what they use when they use these short term events. These 15 to 30 minute sprinting events are carb based. Okay. They need muscle glycogen to make this work. That's a carbohydrate event, okay? They don't use protein or fat in that event. Now, you get over to, to longer work, it completely switches in the dog. And this is a really fascinating thing to me. Dogs become very protein intense when they are longer working. They absolutely switch from using carbohydrates to using protein. So they don't actually need as many carbs in their diet when they do that. They need the protein at that 25 to 30, and they need the fat at the 18 to 22. And those are what's going to maintain their body and maintain their athleticism and maintain their work ability. Okay. Dogs that are working long, they're losing muscle. They don't have enough protein in their diet. And this is, I've seen it over and over and over in long deployments where we'll start out with a certain amount of protein. Maybe they're eating you know, four or five times their normal amount, they're eating, you know, um, instead of being at 25 or 30%, maybe they're eating somewhere between in the 30s for protein, and they're still starting to lose muscle because the work is so hard or so intense, you just keep adding protein. And in those cases, sometimes you have to go to adding whole protein, meaning animal tissue in its, in its whole form. 
All right, supplements. Um, I'm, I don't know where I am time-wise getting close. Um, all right, supplements. Um, supplements are really important if you use them right. Um, I am an absolute pusher um, for all of my working dogs to be on joint supplements, on omega-3 fatty acids, on probiotics, on prebiotics, which are, are soluble fibers to help keep their intestinal microflora happy, keep their stress diarrheas down, keep their joints lubricate, all of the things, 100%. Anti-inflammatory, 100%. The minute you start adding the multi-purpose vitamin mineral supplements that you will see, and those things are ubiquitous out there. If you are feeding a complete and balanced diet, you have just unbalanced it, okay? And for something like a water-soluble B vitamin, nobody cares. You're just wasting your money because water-soluble vitamins get peed out. If you overfeed them, if you overfeed thiamine, you overfeed cobalamin, you overfeed any of the B vitamins, nobody cares. Um, you're wasting your money, but it's going to get peed out on the ground. Body just gets rid of it. You overfeed fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, they're going to get stored in the liver, and now you have great potential for toxicity, which is not going to happen in 10 minutes. It's going to happen over months. That is dangerous. The other thing that's dangerous, and for example, vitamin D, too much vitamin D in their diet, and you're going to increase the risk not only of urinary stones and calcium phosphorus changes. So you're going to start increasing changes of what happens in their body with calcium and phosphorus levels, where it goes in bone, where it's being excreted, and so on. It is, uh, it, it is the silent danger because you can't see it coming, okay? So be very, very careful with supplements that have added vitamins and minerals. Um, minerals are the same way. Uh, you, you have copper and a variety of other minerals that your body has an exquisite need for, but it's a very tiny need. It's, a very, it's what we call a trace mineral. You put too much copper in the diet, you put too much of selenium in the diet, and now it's going to be stored in the liver and copper storage disease in the liver, and you're going to come see me or another internist. Be very careful. Um, look carefully at those supplements. If your diet's balanced, it doesn't need other of these things. They do not need other of these things if you're feeding a good diet. Now, if you are choosing to feed a homemade diet, then the most important thing is to find that really good balanced supplement to be part of your homemade diet. In summary, some things we've talked about. So understanding the workload, understanding the need to adjust diet over time, understanding to look at the individual and increase or decrease based on what you're seeing in the individual. Um, try exquisitely hard to be complete and balanced. So let's just talk for a second about complete and balanced outside of commercial. If it says complete and balanced on the package, it is complete and balanced. That is a federal law. Okay. They can't put it on there if it's not true. Now that doesn't mean that that diet will work for your dog, right? Every individual is going to be different and it might, that, that diet may not be the best one for your dog. If you choose to go to whole food, to go to homemade food, to go to raw food, several things to consider. First and foremost, if you are not using a diet balancing program, if you have not um, got a nutritionist looking at your recipes, um, please do. Um, unbalanced diets, um, again, you, you will not see the impact immediately. It will not be shown to you for months or years. And, and that is something that can be completely prevented if you just take the additional time to get a recipe that is, has been vetted by a, a nutritionist or to get a, a um, diet balancing program and make sure that they're balanced, okay? The last thing I will say about raw, um, there is no question that when you look at foods across the spectrum, when you look at raw foods, when you look at homemade foods, and then you look at commercial foods, raw foods contain the highest digestibility food sources on the planet, hands down, hands down. They are not impacted by being cooked. And so I have had many people want to go to raw 
for the very purpose of having that really high digestibility. See great coats, see great poops, see all of the things because you just don't have the leftovers. That's 100% a good idea, right? Raw food, however, remember, while dogs, uh, GI tracts are used to eating dead things, you're used to seeing dogs go eat the dead carrion, you're seen, used to seeing dogs go eat the things that are awful and, and, and not getting sick from it. The raw food problem is less of a problem for the dog. Yes, you can absolutely get a dog salmonella because the food that you got was too contaminated and it over, over, it basically overcame their own uh, GI tract's ability to protect itself. That's possible. It happens. We see them. The greater danger is to you. Humans actually are pretty weak sisters when it comes to handling those kinds of things when they're exposed to them. And if you are handling raw food, if you're handling food bowls, if you're handling uh, picking up canine feces out of your runs or wherever the heck it is, you are exposing yourself to that increased level of bacteria, which is primarily Salmonella and E. coli, both of which can put you in the hospital right now. And so the, the only reason I caution people about raw food use is you must understand the food safety complications it brings into your life. If you're a healthy adult, don't have any immunocompromise, aren't on any immunocompromising drugs, um, don't have any problems with immune function that you know of, you might be quite fine to do that. But if you have anybody in your family um, that's undergoing cancer chemotherapy, undergoing any kind of immunosuppressive therapy for any reason and you feed raw in your house, you can kill them. It's, it's really that simple. And so the reason I urge extreme caution with raw use is, is the understanding of the human risk, not the animal risk. Um, last but not least, I don't have really much to add about this, is, is that just try to go with the highest digestibility and, and focus on trying to find what is the optimal nutrient range for your animal. And with that, guys, I'm going to... Stop talking and wait to see if we've got some questions. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Zoran. Um, oh, I really appreciate you presenting today. Um, oh, I know we have at least one question in the in the chat box so far. Um, oh, before I get to that, though, if, if you could send me a copy of um, oh, the slides and like a PDF, because I, I, I normally get people that ask um, later on. And so I'd really appreciate Absolutely. that. I can do that. No problem. That's no problem. Um, the question from the chat box was, um, are livestock guardian dogs, such as Great Pyrenees and Karachikan, um, considered in the sprinter group or the intermediate group for determining, um, oh, the multiplying factor for RER? Very, very good question. So they would be in the sprinter group. Um, they are generally not, they are generally not going to work, uh, uh, particularly in our part of the world. Um, uh, long, 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 long um, periods of time over days and days and days with constant activity. Um, they're they're going to rest and then work and then rest and then work. So that goes in the sprinter group. Um, they are very much um, breed groups that um, you need to be very, very careful about because of their body size, uh, about keeping them lean. Um, you need to be very, very, very careful about early in life um, with them about being sure about their, um, how fast they're growing, about feeding uh, calcium phosphorus ranges uh, that are not, that are, they're going to try to keep you out of trouble for their joints. Um, and, and then last but not least, with, with all of those groups, um, um, because they're, they're in that sprinter group, I would also be super careful with how much um, car, I mean, excuse me, uh, fat that you're feeding them uh, because it's super easy with all that hair on, even if you're shaving them, whew, super easy for them to put on a layer that you don't see. And that's, that's going to be heat intolerance. That's going to be exercise um, decline and athletic performance decline. That's going to be injury risk. Um, all of those things. Okay. Very good um, oh, the question is what about feeding raw cow's milk to dogs? Yeah, so um, um, again, um, in, in small quantities, um, as, as part of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get some more calories in them, or I'm trying to get a little bit more protein in them, I don't have strong um, opposition to that. But what I can tell you, 
um, there is a wide variety and variation in the canine ability to handle lactose. Very wide. There are some dogs that are like people, if they uh, get a little bit of it and adapt their GI ecosystem to it, <coughs> that they do quite fine with it. In other words, they don't develop diarrhea, they don't have an issue. Uh, it's just added calories. Um, there are a fairly large number of dogs that cannot adapt to anything that is more than just a couple of squirts of this because they, they literally do la lack lactase enzyme. It has to be upregulated up to be functional. Some dogs don't do it. It's just like having lactase deficiency in people and all the people that have to do lactate or have to have uh, or, or not drink milk. <laughs> Excuse me. The next question is, I guess, along those same lines, would it be better to use goat milk versus cow's milk if you were going to try to do that? Yeah, it's the same issue. It's the same issue. Um, milk, all milks, whether they're goat milk, any kind of milk, all milks are based on um, sucrose and lactose as their basic sugars. That's what milk sugars are, uh, lactose and sucrose. And sucrose is like what's in simple sugar, right? That's why it's such a good energy source. <clears throat> it's like it's it's a it's a bang energy source. That's great if you're busy. <laughs> um, not so great. It's good for fat if you're not so busy. Um, but it's the lactose that that can cause GI upset and imbalance. Okay. Uh, the next one is the um, they wanted to know a little bit more about cardiomyopathy and their relation to kibble. If there's any specific ingredients yep. to avoid. Yeah. Nope. So, so the, the cardiomyopathy associated um, with kibble food eating is, is the grain-free foods that are completely grain-free, okay? So in other words, they're the kibble, the, the dog foods that have removed not only the wheats and the corns, which a lot of pet owners don't want their dogs eating wheats and corns because they've either had skin problems or had allergy problems and, and they did better without it. But the, the dog foods that have removed all grains, so all of the barleys, the rice, the oats, the rices, all of the grains removed. And when you do that, grains are a, an incredibly important source of a lot of the <clears throat> amino acids and fatty acids that dog need, dogs need. Um, really incredibly important sources. You can get them by adding them in, sort of chemically adding them in, but grains are the easiest and most nutritious way to do that. And so when you take them away, if, you, if your um, nutritionists aren't replacing that, that lack of those um, amino acids takes away carnitine and taurine, makes them not less available. The dogs don't have the precursors to make them. Taurine and carnitine are essential for heart muscle function. And so they literally develop a cardiomyopathy, a heart muscle disease, because of the lack of these precursors in their diet from, from, not, from not having grains in their diet or not having the proper replacement for what was in those grains. So you have to be very careful with grain-free diets. Very careful. Um, the next question is, is they're feeding a diet of fermented raw food recommended by their vet. Um, is this any safer or better? So the idea behind fermented is to um, reduce the bacterial population, right? Um, of, of, the, of the pathogenic sources. Fermented sources are good bacteria. So, so like when you eat sauerkraut, for example, <laughs> sauerkraut's a, a, a full of bacteria, right? It's, a, it's a absolutely like eating um, yogurt on steroids. Um, the same idea here is what you're doing is you're trying to eat more good bacteria and that fermentation of that of those sources tries to limit the pathogens. The problem is, is that anytime you feed raw, you got to understand that raw company's food source. And that, that's, a, that's a question that you have to investigate your own self, right? What is their food source? Where are they getting their raw? Is this, is, is this rendered raw? Is this uh, human food grade raw? Is this, what is it? Uh, how, are, how do they store it? How do they package it? How do they handle it? Um, and those are, those, are, those are all things that you have to investigate your own self. They're not gonna tell you. 
that's, um, that's a challenge. One, the next one is, is they um, heard that Costco dog foods made by Blue Diamond uh, says they have a livestock guardian dog that sprints, but mostly rests. Um, is that type of food okay? And is it okay to mix in wet food? Um, and also adding in a couple eggs to the diet. Okay, so let me start with, um, and, and obviously you can't answer this question, but my very first question to you would be, how is the dog doing on the diet? And then the first question I ask you about that is, is the dog in good physical condition? Is the muscle good? Is he lean? In other words, he's doing well on the diet. That's the first question. Second question I would ask is, does, does the dog's skin and hair coat look healthy? In other words, is it flaky, dry, any of that sort of stuff? Because that's telling you the, the diet isn't completely meeting needs. And then the last thing I would ask is, what do the stools look like? Um, is this dog having really large stools? Is he having stinky soft stools? Is he having normal, small, regular stool? What do they look like? If all of those things are good and, and that's what your dog is doing and the dog is, 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 is able to work, the diet's fine. In other words, you can feed any diet on the planet if it meets those needs for the dog. And on the label, it says this is complete and balanced. So that's a long answer. And there's some things you're going to have to answer back. But there's no need to add an egg if all of those things are true. If, if, if he doesn't look like he's got good muscle mass, then to me that would tell you maybe his protein in that diet maybe isn't quite high enough. I would rather you change the diet to a little bit higher amount of protein in the diet itself rather than just adding an egg. Because what you're doing there is if you add an egg today, uh, but don't do it tonight and then do it tomorrow, but then don't do it the next day, we don't have a balanced diet. We just all, we have different things, right? So what we're trying to get is to some level of consistency and find out where we can make that best fit. Okay, and then kind of going on with the egg thing again, they wanted to know if eggs are a good way to give them omega-3s, and then can you feed too many eggs too often? You can feed too many of anything, right? You can feed too many of anything. So um, eggs are great. Eggs are the perfect protein source. They're, they're a good fat source. Um, they are a good omega source. Um, the bottom line is too much of anything, right? Um, so if, if you're feeding a diet and your dog is in ideal condition and working well, um, and you're wanting to do this as a treat source, as opposed to using the other kinds of treat sources, then I'm hundred percent okay with it. <clears throat> if you're doing it to flush up your diet, because you don't think your diet's meeting your needs, then my approach would be rather than try to make your diet better by adding a bunch of eggs to it, try to find a better diet. Sounds like good advice. But too many eggs. Yeah. More, 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 more than an egg a day. And now you're starting to get into that whole business of eggs have a certain amount of this, but they don't have this over here. So you're imbalancing your whole equation. Um, I think you kind of already answered this one just in your presentation, but um, they have livestock guardian dog puppies and mm -hmm. they wanted to know, do you recommend a large breed puppy food? And if so, how long should they feed that? large breed puppy chow. Are they Pyrenees, I assume? Or um, they're Kar Karachikan. Okay. Karachikan. Yeah. So, so, so yes, absolutely. Um, I, I strongly encourage large breed puppy. It's not only the calcium phosphorus that's been managed, but it's, it's how energy sources, we, we don't want them to grow too quickly. Uh, that's how we get into pan, pan osteitis and a whole bunch of other joint ills that <clears throat> happen. Um, so, I'm a big fan of large breed, feed it all the way to at least 18 months, two years. And okay. I assume they're keeping them intact, but if they're not keeping them intact, in other words, if for some reason they have to be neutered before that 18 month, two year category, be very careful with, you're going to have to cut back food because they will, if you keep feeding the puppy food beyond when they have been neutered or spayed, Oh boy, they'll put on weight big time because it's still puppy food, right? Okay, well, that was a question I was just going to ask you. So thank you for answering that. Yeah. Um, the next one is, uh, should they give their adult livestock guardian dogs free access to feed or restricted feed? Um, 
big fan, big fan of restricted feeding or, or, or meal feeding. Know how much food you put in there and what they ate every day. Um, because that way you can adjust when they're in a, in a non-working cycle and you know how much you need to adjust down. If you're just free access feeding them, you, husbandry wise, you have no clue how much that animal is eating every day. So maybe he's eating to meet his needs and he looks beautiful and wonderful and he's a perfect condition. He's all of the things and it makes your life easy because he can just go and eat it whenever he wants. But, but if he's a dog that either A, needs less calories because he's gaining weight or B, needs a special diet that has more of this or less of that, you have no clue of where to start because he just feeds, in, feeds his own self. Um, from a husbandry perspective, from a medical, from, from my perspective, as a, as a veterinarian that sees health issues, one of the first questions I'm going to ask you is, how much is he eating and, and has that changed? And what is the food that he's eating and what is happening to it? And if you're just free choice feeding, you're going to know what he's feeding. You're going to have no, no clue about any of the other stuff. And, and when it comes to GI illnesses, or illnesses, or sudden weight loss for no particular reason, or, or some of the um, endocrine disorders, that information is absolutely necessary. And it will, it will cause me to send you home and say, okay, now we gotta, you got to start feeding me by meal so I know what you're doing. Um, so from a husbandry or medical issue, it's a really good safety thing. The next question is, um, oh, their livestock gardening dog eats their goats nutritional yeast and kelp. Um, I guess that's a supplement or maybe some sort of a feed. Um, they want to know if there's any problem with that. Eats, eats like large amounts of it or just snacks on it? Um, I guess I'll kind of go along with that. A lot of our guardian dogs eat the, uh, yeah. the feed that we put out for the sheep and goats. Um, it's like a pellet, yeah. protein pellet. Yeah. Um, and I get yeah. that question a lot of times too. Is it okay for the dogs yeah. to do that kind of thing? So, my first answer is going to be a disliked answer. It's going to be, it depends. Um, I'd want to look at the label of that and see what are we talking about? Um, yeah. You know, it, it might be like treats to them. It might be, um, it might not be enough protein to really make a big difference and, and kelp, um, little bits of kelp ain't going to be any big thing, but a whole lot of kelp could be. So yeah, it depends, but, Again, if they're out in and amongst those animals and they have free access to that, it's going to be tough to, tough to keep that totally out of their diet. So it, I would want to, I'd want to take a look at it and say, is there anything in here that scares me? Okay. Um, the next one is they have six um, Crotchican livestock guardian dogs. They feed five of them, 27% protein and 10% fat. Uh, they want to know if that's a poor food choice for them. Is it too high of protein, too low of fat? Um, I'll go with that portion of the, the question first. Okay, very good. So, so um, the, the ratio might be quite good if they're females, um, if they do have high workload and they need that to maintain muscle mass, um, but they need the lower energy because they tend to gain weight. On the other hand, um, it may be more protein than they really need because they really aren't that active. They could do better with 20 or 22 because remember what you're asking them to do with 27 protein. If they are not actively working and using that, that protein is just being degraded. Um, it will be stored as fat energy, but in the degradation process, all those amino acid groups, which are the parts that the liver and the kidneys have to deal with, um, are creating high workload that over time can lead to proteinuria, meaning they're peeing out excess protein in their urine. And that can be a problem. So I would first look at the dog and say, are you ideal condition? And is your muscle ideal? Okay, that's good. And then my next question would be, how much am I, how much are you working? Are you, are you working like, working, I mean active work, not laying around and then walking and moving, but active work over the day, then maybe you're using that protein for energy for the muscle. But if you're not active working, then you're, then you're just putting it into the system and the system's going to have to deal with it. And that's where you get in trouble over time. 
Um, the second question is they have um, a sixth dog that's overweight and has hip dysplasia. Mm. And so they're currently feeding her an 18% protein, 6% fat. And mm. they want to know if that's a, a reasonable choice for an overweight dog or if they mm. should go with some other diet. Mm. Nope. That's that, that is, um, 6% fat's actually quite good for an overweight dog. Um, what, um, what's, I wish I could, we could actually have a conversation. My first question would be, um, one of the problems that we can run into in muscle, uh, in, in weight loss situations is we, we take away so much of their food, um, that they lose muscle because their body starts chewing on that, um, as you're trying to get them to lose weight. So, so my, my, my recommendation to you with an OA dog, so a dog with osteoarthritis that has gotten overweight is keep a close eye on that 18. Um, if the dog's muscle mass is, is crappy, I would leave it there. If the do dog's muscle mass is still good, then I would maybe try to back it down a little bit because it's still energy, but try to see how much more, how, how much can you exercise this dog to help drive muscle work because weight loss by diet alone is impossible. You have to combine it with active muscle use. And I know dogs that have osteoarthritis have trouble with that. And so what I usually recommend to people in those settings is try to find ways to get them to exercise without impact. And a really good way to do that is get them to swim. Okay. Low impact, um, high muscle use. This next question, and I was going to actually ask this question of you myself, but they wanted to know the best way to check weight and muscle condition of uh, livestock guardian dogs, or just how to do body condition scoring. Dog, dogs in general, good. That's a very good question. I almost put that in here, and then I thought, mm, maybe that's too much. Very good. So I'm going to point to this dog here that's in front of me. Um, um, it's a little bit hard because he's wearing, here, let me go back. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to go back to uh, a bunch of some slides earlier. Uh, let me get back to, let me get back to Callie. Here's Callie. Callie, my, my crazy girl. All right. So Callie, so when you're looking, um, Callie is a, a Labrador mixed with a black mouth cur. Um, she's a little bit of the devil. Um, she, body condition score is by checking three areas. Okay. She is over conditioned in this picture. Um, she just got, um, this is actually a relatively recent picture. She just came off an injury um, and being a female and being in a crate and not working. Um, you can see several things about her. Um, one, you cannot see her ribs. Um, a body condition um, three out of nine. So it's a nine scale. One is a dog that's like skeletal. Nine is the fattest thing you can ever see that you can barely tell that it's anything but a, but a dog, okay? So what we're looking for in pet dogs is four or five. She is an ideal conditioned pet dog. But in a working dog, we want them lean. We want no fat. We want to see ribs. Her tuck for her is, is okay. She doesn't have a, a greyhound tuck because of her build. But you would want to see tuck. You would want to palpate over her shoulder blades, palpate over the hips, palpate over the base of the tail, palpate over the crown of the head. If you can feel anything but skin, you're going to feel skin. But if you can feel anything but skin under there, if they're squishy under there, there's fat. That's fat store areas. Okay. And so um, the, the body condition score for a four or a five, this is what she had. You might be able to feel a little bit, but it's not much. Okay. A, a six is going to be this dog's belly starts to flatten out and you will feel a fat pad over here and a fat pad over here, literally an easy fat pad. Okay. And it just goes up. But in your, your dogs with all your fur, you're going to have to put your hands on to, to, to feel that. Now, muscle condition is a whole different thing, and it's got to be based on, it's based on breed and comparisons to breed, um, and you got to do it repetitiously, so it's a little bit harder to explain, but what I'm looking for in, in, in a lot of my working dogs are even Bel either Belgian Malinois or their labs, and so 
both of those breeds, because we're, we need them to, to not only do a lot of distance work on the ground, but they ought to have to do a lot of agility work over very difficult terrain. They have to be a little bit of a cross between a CrossFit and a, and a marathoner. Um, and so not only is there leanness involved, but you want these muscles to have tone all over. In other words, when you palpate muscles, there is, you, you have grabbed the arm of a human that doesn't work out. It's squishy. Um, you grab the, uh, the muscles on the back of the legs here. This is the same as the, this is like your hamstring back here. This is like your quadriceps right here, the muscle on the front of your, uh, on the front of your, your upper leg out in front of your femur. Um, you can palpate muscles on their backs. Most of the time, these muscles um, are, are not loose or weak, um, but these guys on the front of the shoulder, these guys behind on the elbow up here, and these guys here are good places to test to see what their muscle condition feels like. In other words, do they have it there? Is it flobby? Is it missing? And honestly, when we do this um, for my working dogs, a lot of times we do measurements, but that's a little more sophisticated and, and less important. What you're just trying to do is see where they are. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one is, uh, they were told by their breeder um, to feed a cheap adult dog food to their puppy to keep it from growing too fast. Um, what would be the issue with doing this? And, um, they currently, they have them on a large breed puppy chow. Okay. So, so, so back again to, um, the whole puppy, uh, thing. So the, the idea about feeding a adult food to a puppy is one of the things that gets puppies in trouble is when they eat regular puppy food, that is very energy dense. Okay. And so, the larger breed puppies, then their bones will grow too fast and they will outgrow uh, their muscles and their bones grow asynchronously and their, and their growth joints grow asynchronously. And that's where you get elbow dysplasias and hip dysplasias and all of the things. And this is very well documented now that part of that problem is related to energy in the diet, but it is not entirely that. It is also the proportions of calcium and phosphorus it is also the proportions of other minerals. And so by feeding an adult food to a puppy, you, you help that problem of too much energy growing too fast. You do not help the problem of the calcium, phosphorus, and other mineral balance because it's meant for an adult dog that's already full grown. The, the large breed puppy um, food has very specific um, calcium, phosphorus balance and other mineral balance that is intended to mitigate those problems, not just the energy problem, but the growth problem. So we strongly encourage, particularly the giant breeds or the large breeds to use large breed puppy. It, the brand to me is you pick, you find the brand that your dog likes that they do well on. Um, Find a brand that is reputable. Find a brand that says complete and back. Find a brand that you know has been in business a long time. The brand is less important than, than its large breed. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, oh, adding um, nutritional yeast, about two tablespoons to dry food. Is that okay or, or not? Yeah, no problems. No harm, no foul. Okay. Um, next one is how many times a day should they feed their livestock guardian dog? Oh, that's an excellent question. So, um, that also, again, depends on what's happening. Uh, look, I see a name on here that I love. I love it so much. Christy Borman's on this call. <laughs> um, one of the things that it's incredibly important to do in, in feeding any dog is, is schedule regularity. Um, and so I, I am a big proponent. Um, a, a lot of, a lot of working dog folks like to feed their dogs once a day. Some of them will feed twice a day. Um, once a day feeding, um, creates this situation or circumstance where your body is literally going through a starvation maintenance phase in that period of time when they're not eating. It's, 
it's an easy way to sort of manage calories and manage things, but it also creates some challenges for weight maintenance, um, particularly in spayed or neutered dogs. Um, so once a day feeding, I do not encourage. Um, I especially do not encourage it when we have dogs that are in active work. Because one of the things that you don't want to do is you don't want them actively working on a, on a heavy or full stomach, right? And so um, if you know that this is going to be a heavy work day or, you, or this is a heavy work season, um, having them eat multiple smaller meals as best fits into your schedule is actually better for them. Um, a, a breakfast, uh, a middle of the day, and the end of the day, if that can be managed or if they are in, in if they are brought in out of a location or, and that can be done. If they are out in the field and you don't see them and they get their food X time and X time, morning and night, that is quite fine. Um, we have to adapt our feeding schedules with working dogs a lot more specifically to their deployment schedule than to their daily work schedule. And so your daily work schedule is a little bit more complicated but if they're coming out of a season where they're not working actively and they're going to be more sitting at the house, um, I would still maintain the t at least twice a day schedule, just being very careful about how much you're feeding or again, adapting down that protein and, and, and fat level. Okay. The next question is um, they're in a Northern climate. Um, mm -hmm. Dogs are outside basically 24 seven all year round. Um, does food intake increase much during winter due to colder temps or should they feed about the same amount year round? Uh, again, another excellent question. And, and again, I'm coming back around to depends. Um, this is metabolism dependent and work dependent. Um, absolutely. Uh, dogs in Northern climes um, are going to use a lot more energy um, to maintain warmth if they don't, aren't carrying any fat cover, right? Um, their, their fat on their body is going to be that part of that warmth thing. So if you're keeping their body condition at working level because they are working and you want to maintain that, then you will have to probably up either um, protein and or carbs or maybe fat energy, depending on, on what their workload is, to help them not only maintain their body temperature and warmth, but also their, their muscle, because they're going to burn energy keeping warm when they're outside. Um, so yes, it, it, but it depends. It's, it's animal dependent, it's coat dependent, it's work dependent. Um, if they're constantly moving and they're constantly exercising, then their, their needs to keep warm may not be as high as that animal that is in a resting and then works for short periods of time and then goes and rests again. Okay, so the last question for today, um, is OCD of the shoulder genetic, environmental, nutritional, or a combination of all three? Combination of all three. Um, no question, there, there, are, there are genetic components to this. Those have not been defined enough that I can tell you don't read this line but we do know that that's why we take radiographs as veterinarians because we're trying really, 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 really hard to not breed those certain pairs. On the other hand, we also know that there's a nutritional component comes back around again to feeding imbalanced diets, feeding too much energy, feeding too many certain kinds of minerals. Um, so, so most of our, most of our joint and limb problems, whether it's OCD, whether it's elbow dysplasia, whether it's um, pan osteitis, whether it's hip dysplasia, all of them have both components of nutrition and growth rate and workload as well as, so in other words, the phenotype of the world versus the genetics or genotype of the problem. So it, it, it is, it, it's not 100% manageable by any of the above. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much, Dr. Zorn. I really appreciate you coming out today and um, giving our presentation. Um, we had a lot of good questions and thank you to everybody that was logged in today. Um, oh, I just want to thank again, our sponsor, Lone Star Tracking, also the Sheep and Goat Predator Management Board for making my position uh, possible at the AgriLife Center, Dr. Redden, our interim director, and of course, Robert Pritz um, for helping us keep the 
webinar is up and going. So thank you very much, everybody. And if you have any questions that come up, um, feel free to email me or post them on our Facebook page. And I will uh, forward those on to Dr. Zoran and, and get her to answer those for you. So thank you guys very much. Very good, everybody. Thank you.